Hello everyone, um, I'm doing this recording at the airport. I'll be making a quick trip to Thailand just over the weekend, but I'll still be able to see you next week, hopefully. Uh, so this is my entry for chapter 3, Dramatic Action. Um, in the beginning of this lesson, uh, the creature and the teacher or the author talks about talkies which is the old word for the first movies, uh, the first movies with sound. Um, why it was called talkies is because uh, the audience was finally able to hear what the actors were talking about, hence they are called talkies. Uh, the creature was at first resistant to the idea, but the teacher says the artist should march abreast of their times and do their best. Uh, basically, she was resistant to the idea, no, she, she was very set in her ways of you know, being used to performing in theatre, but um, not used to and, and, and not receptive to the um, to the ways of the, the new wave of filming at that point in time, which, which was still new. Um, but the, the author, or Richard Poleslavsky here says that the artists should march abreast of their times and do their best. So on this point itself, I wonder what is the next frontier for acting is. Um, you know, what I can think of is something like maybe a matrix-like simulation where we can actually feel what the characters and the actors feel. So would these be called feelies? Uh, and you know, like right now, there's the choose-your-own-adventure type of filmmaking in the form of uh, in-game cinematics where whatever you choose in the game, uh, the in-game cinematics would be different uh, depending on your choice. And also there's recently the Netflix Black Mirror Bandersnatch. And I guess these new formats of filmmaking, uh, and I would say, you know, even with these new formats of filmmaking, um, the old formats would still be popular, would still be at play. Uh, this, these new formats would be quite demanding of an actor as they have to play the multiple possible plot lines based on the user's choice. But as technology progresses, the art demands more from the actor. Well, technology progresses, but sometimes when technology progresses, it, it makes it easier for storytellers, for filmmakers, and for artists and for actors to to work. But at the same time, so sometimes it also demands more from an actor. And the next point is actually, or rather, the main point of the chapter is about <coughs> dramatic action. Um, in real life, actions are more convincing than words. Like when you you have friends or people in your life, when they say something, but they don't do what they say they're gonna do, right? That's not as convincing as people who actually do, but they say less. People who actually uh, take action or do what they say they want to do. Right? So actions are more convincing than words. And since acting is a kind of a reflection of real life, kind of a hyper-realistic rendition of life is a portrayal, the actions of a character conveys more meaning or as much meaning as the words that the characters say. Okay. So the teacher says that actions are easier to remember than words. <coughs> Repeat the dramatic actions often enough and you can remember it. And this is why rehearsals are important. I'm not sure how much I agree with this as I have rarely got the opportunity to uh, really perform at the professional level. But I find that words are easier to remember for me with enough repetitions. Whereas for actions, I am more uh, maybe playful and forgetful. And often I like to try different movements and actions for the same sentence in a script. And I don't have any experience in other kinds of physical performance, whether it be dancing or uh, expressive theatre. And I'm not that into sports either, where a lot of trained muscle memory is useful. But I think it's because you know, all of us are wired a bit differently. All of us are you know, configured a bit differently uh, in our brains. And I remember at one point, we touched briefly on learning styles for me, which is uh, mostly um, visual and auditory. But I guess on a deeper animalistic level, the most deeply ingrained learnings are motor memory. Uh, but I think if I can recall, I just read recently that some people with uh, some form of mental impairment or dementia, they, when they lose memories, uh, they somehow don't lose their memories of music and songs. So that should maybe warrant some kind of homework and research into how relevant it is, uh, that is to us. So anyway, whatever the method is, the dramatic actions of a character that accompanies their dialogue or non-dialogue is what conveys the action, the drama, and it's actually what moves the story along. 
And this lesson also talks about how some writers, for example, Shakespeare, uh, in this particular lesson, uh, the author says that Shakespeare has very specific requirements for what an actor should do and what an actor should exactly do. Uh, he doesn't like taking chances uh, with actors because he feels that you know the story is his own story um, uh, and, and he has a high sense of ownership of his own stories. He, I guess that's the way Shakespeare works. But nowadays, in films, for example, it's mostly the, direct, the, the director who calls the shots. Of course, there are other stakeholders as well, but it's mostly the director who calls the shots. And some directors I read or hear about are more collaborative and open and allows actors to interpret the text their own way, but of course guided by <coughs> some kind of uh, overarching uh, lead motifs, themes and emotions. Whereas some directors are more OCD, uh, like for example Stanley Kubrick. But, uh, but I believe even for such OCD directors, it would still be the actor's responsibility to understand uh, the context and subtext of the text itself and also try and understand what the director ultimately wants. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this has been my, I guess, five to six minutes of my uh, submission for chapter three on dramatic action. I'll see you guys next week.